Chapter Twenty Four of Bizarre by Lawton McCall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nick Bulka. My Museum. I called her Plury. That is to say, I would speak of her by that endearing appellation when she was running along smoothly and seldom missing in either cylinder. Her real name, however, was E. Pluribus Unum. You see, I had wanted an automobile, but found that no single make was within my means. So I bought Plury, just as a person who cannot afford beef, veal, chicken, turkey, lamb or pork, orders hash. Individually, Fords, Buicks, Overlands, Peerlesses, Simplexes, Pierce Arrows, etc., were too expensive for me, but collectively, combined in the form of second-hand plury, I could afford them all, at $132.50. Plury was a cosmopolitan. Her rear axle was Italian, her steering wheel was French, her magneto was Austrian, and her mudguards were Belgian. It was hard to maintain her neutrality. For example, a German cogwheel that clutched with an English one, scarred veterans, both of them, kept the gearbox in a constant state of friction. When such international clashes occurred, it was always difficult to find out which one had started the trouble. Then, too, among the American-made parts, there was much jealousy between those that had come from rival factories. The tires were of four different makes each boasting a surface specially patented against skidding, but each strove so hard to shove the other three into the gutter that all four cavorted about the road in a most unseemly fashion. Many were the heart-burnings, the incompatibilities of temperament, of the parts that yoked together. Whenever these dissensions brought matters to a standstill, I would have to get out and apply the monkey wrench of peace. Plury was hardly a noble car in either appearance or speed, yet I was genuinely fond of her. Her lamps had a wistful look, a look as innocent and helpless as that which poached eggs gazed up at you before they die. As for her slowness, that made little difference, because her speedometer, geared presumably for a racing car, exaggerated, and, after all, what is speed by the number on the dial? While I saw 71 registered there, I was not disturbed by the fact that bicyclists were passing me. I admired her pluck. She would chunk along stoically, accepting other people's dust without complaint, when in a condition of health that would have prostrated any other machine. Thoroughbreds do not show the greatest endurance. Bravely she would drag herself home after a hard afternoon's work with a leak in her radiator and congestion in all her bearings. I used to practice vivisection on her, taking her apart and putting her together in new ways. It was a fascinating kind of solitaire, solving the problem of what to do on rainy Sundays. In a few hours' time I could shuffle the parts and deal out an entirely new model. Under my care, Plury changed her shape with ultra-fashionable frequency. A model that I was particularly interested in trying out was number nine, i.e., the eighth transformation. This was such a daring rearrangement that it seemed too wonderful to be true. But it worked, and thrillingly. In this form, Plury exceeded all her previous speed records. The speedometer dial registered 87 and a swarm of gnats had hard work keeping up with us. Proceeding at this reckless pace, we approached a hilly curve marked Danger, Drive Slowly. I changed gear. The cogs emitted a grating, crunching sound, as of quartz in a stone crusher, and then subsided. I got out to view their death grapple. But I had no sooner set foot upon the ground than the roar of an infuriated klaxon startled me so that I leaped clear aside into the ditch. In that instant a huge fiat, armed with a brazen fender, swung around the curve and rammed plury in the radiator. 
Plury splattered like a charlotte russe hit by a sledgehammer. The road and neighboring fields were full of her. The liveried chauffeur of the Fiat got out and began to brush the dust from the front of his car. A frightened fat man picked himself up from the floor of the tonneau and called to me, Are you badly hurt? No, I replied. I'm all right, I think. Good, he said in a tone of great relief. Then let's settle the damages at once, for I don't want this thing to get into the papers. With a shaky hand he drew out a checkbook. What was the value of your car? I hesitated. Would you consider five thousand sufficient indemnity to close the whole matter? Personal injuries, property damages, and everything? I considered it. And after he had gone, I finally stooped and kissed Plurry's tin remains. End of chapter 24